Hello, everyone, and welcome to Sega Saturn Shiro, the only podcast playable in all language and regions. I'm Patrick, and tonight's heroes are Kay, Peter, and myself. Tonight we'll be giving you an update on Saturn since our last cast, and talk about some fan translation projects and just some fan projects in general. I guess for everyone that doesn't know, we basically were able to get our hands on the RetroBit controllers, and Peter actually wrote up a really nice article about that and got to test it quite a bit. So Peter, did you want to go into the controls a little bit and give us a little introduction? Yeah, sure thing. So first of all, a big shout out to uh, our friends at RetroBit for being able to send us samples of the Saturn and the Genesis controllers. And what we received were both the original console controllers as well as the USB versions. And they came in both the black as well as the uh, sort of fancy colors. So for Genesis, it was this clear blue, which looks really cool. And for the Saturn, they were uh, slate gray. So the face of the controller is actually see-through and you can see the uh, PCB underneath. And in the back of it's like this very smoky gray. And then the buttons are colored just like uh, the uh, Japanese version of this controller was. So my overall impressions are really quite favorable. So Retrobit, you know, having had the, um, having secured the uh, official license, I mean, these controllers look exactly like the originals did. Um, you know, they feel uh, just the same in terms of weight and texture and that kind of thing. Other observations I had is Retrobit did a really nice job uh, in the packaging of these controllers. So again, they really just followed the uh, templates from Sega from back in the day. And they I, they just accentuated them with uh, modern packaging uh, techniques. So we've got some foil and some gloss, and it just looks really slick. Um, and the fact that they were able to follow the original packaging means that, you know, these new products are going to look really good on your shelf beside all of your originals because they'll fit in, you know, at a glance, they're going to look exactly the same. And upon, you know, a closer look, what you're going to essentially get a feeling of is that this is, it's almost like a deluxe edition because it just looks, you know, cooler and sleeker. Uh, but the controllers themselves are pretty solid. And really in terms of the Saturn pad, you know, this is going to be a great uh, replacement if you have an original pad that's starting to sort of go flaky on you. The D-pad, the buttons, they all look really good. They feel really nice. I did notice that there was a difference in the uh, shoulder buttons, the keys. They're not as clicky as the originals were, and they don't depress as much as the originals did. So, um, you know, if that's if that's a if that's a big uh, factor for you, then you, you know you need to be aware of that. But overall, I mean, this was such a solid uh, first go for Retrobit, and it really makes me excited for, you know, their next wave of Sega controllers that they've got coming out. Yeah, I was definitely excited about that when I heard from the article that you gave it a pretty good review. I'm really excited to try this out myself. Uh, Kay, were you able to try them out? Because I know they're at PRGE uh, last year, right? Yeah, they were at PRGE last year, and... Ben did some testing with them. I did not get a chance to uh, do anything more than just pick one up and feel it and you know look at the packaging for what they had out. So I had a question. Did any of you guys sniff the controller? Of course. How Didn't does it you? smell? You know, well, I mean, I always sniff my controllers, but you know, it's kind of a weird thing to say. But like when I like when I got my new old stock Saturn controller, I sniffed it and smelled like the plasticiness and the the cleanliness of it. But like, what did you do when you smelt it? You know what? I, I when I smelt it, I just sort of realized that Retrobit even got that part of it right. So you know, my hats off to them. They they just really did such a great job with the smell as well. Nice. I'm glad the smell is intact and represented well in these controllers. It's always good to when you get one of those new controller smells. You just go up to the controller and be like, ah, "That's some good controller yep. smell." That was a nine. I give it nine sniffs out of ten. It's just that's, solid. That's good. Good sniff. Sometimes. Things happen on this show, and you just left with your mouth just kind of going, wow. Come on, Kay. You can't tell me you, you like got a new controller. You did not not sniff it. No, I, I honestly can't say that I do that. <laughs> okay. Okay, I guess I'm just weird then. <laughs> it, it, like, you, you get hit in the face if you open a pack of magic cards with that new card smell, but I've never really had that happen with a controller. Yeah, I love the new card smell. That's like one of my favorite smells. Like the, you know, like when I opened up my Yu-Gi-Oh cards when I got them back in the day, just got that sniff of mmm, good, good, good cardboardy goodness. Anyways, um, yeah, we're really excited to try this out. We actually have 
have a more a video coming out with both uh, Ben and I that we're going to be working on that'll go more in depth, uh, take it apart, and hopefully test out some more fighters. Well, at least like fighters as in just trying out the quarter circles, making sure stuff like Street Fighter, Vampire Savior, etc. I noticed that there was some communication from the community asking us about responsiveness and accidental diagonals being input. What we're doing with the controllers right now is, you know, everybody in um, the Shiro group, starting with Peter, is going to be utilizing these. Um, we're going to be shipping them off to each other to do further testing. And we just to make sure that I'm remembering this correctly, we received one each one of each color for the original plug version of the controllers and then one of each color for the usb version of the controllers is that right peter that is correct so i have a, a device here it's called a cade k-a-d-e and it allows you to utilize different controllers from different companies on different you know various types of hardware it acts as a, a controller interpreter i guess and one of the purposes I have for this device is to plug it into like a, the Saturn uh, controller into it and then it into PC testing software. And I'll be running through some controller moves in Street Fighter you know, through an emulator. We'll keep an eye on what inputs are getting popped in. If I don't end up doing that, I'll be sending it off to, to Pat for that same kind of testing. Come to the end conclusion of who's going to do what yet, but... We also have a pair of SLS controllers, one PC version, the USB version, the other is the PlayStation 2 version. So we'll be able to test against those as well for the clickiness and everything else. Yeah, I'm kind of excited to hear your opinion on it, Kay, because I know that you preferential for the fight pads for Street Fighter on the Saturn. Yeah, I own a lot of sticks and I love playing on stick, but for some reason, my favorite fighting game on the Saturn is being 0-3, I just find it much more comfortable for some reason to play with a pad. And I never really figured out why. Maybe that's just, you know... Like, I, I can play 0-3 on a stick, and I can play 0-3 on the Saturn on a stick. Um, I can play Alpha 3 or 0-3 on Arcade on a stick, but my preference tends to be to play on the Saturn uh, Japanese-style pad. I gotcha. Are you, uh... Which characters do you usually main? I'm a pretty hardcore shoto player for zero three so i'll play a lot of uh, goki slash akuma and a lot of ken primarily as my mains and then secondary stuff i like playing with gen he's he's my main in street fighter 4 so try to go back to my alpha you know play style and trying to get better with him in alpha has always been a goal of mine nice yeah it's probably just i guess you maybe find a little bit is it easier to roll the quarter circle stuff versus the stick the zero three engine has kind of a flaw in it and it allows an almost infinite juggle with akuma so i enjoy exploiting that um and i'm not godlike at it by any means but what i'll do is i'll challenge myself and play like the two versus one modes and like reverse uh dramatic battle i think is what it's called and i'll try and play as akuma using that exploit and I find that like switching back and forth between stick or pad, the pad does end up seeming to be easier for me to, to be responsive to having enemies on either side of me. I gotcha. That's fair enough. That's, that's really interesting. I actually, uh, all right, so I'm going to put a note. Do not play K at Street <laughs> Fighter 03 with Akuma because I will get rolled. Okay, so that note's down there. Um, <laughs> did you guys have, have anything else before we move on? Well, you know, I'm just going to say that it's super exciting that these controllers are actually licensed. Because really what that means is that we're actually getting the first bit of, you know, official Saturn hardware that we've had in years and years. And I mean, you know, if this stuff does well on the market, um, if fans eat this up, then, you know, there's always possibility that we're going to have future, you know, hardware or who knows what else on the horizon. And that to me is just incredibly exciting. Yeah, definitely, and it just goes. It just shows that maybe Sega has faith in this for once and doing this marketing, and it makes me wonder uh, if this is gonna be that great. I wonder how their new mini Genesis that they've announced is gonna be if they're going to this quality control standards. Yeah, definitely, because if you'll recall, I think it was At Games that was going to do it, but then uh, Sega pulled the plug on that. So you know, if that was due to quality concerns, then that's that's just good news to me. I think that for me. Um... 
it's exciting to see the original designs being brought back in and then some tweaks on that like and we've seen the mock-ups of the Saturn controllers that have the thumbsticks on like added onto them for more modern gameplay I want to see what the next evolution would be you don't really get to see that in most console generations where you start off with one controller and you end off with another you know the last time we saw that I think really happened Saturn was one of those where we had like the US boomerang style and it quote unquote evolved or you know devolved whatever to the Japanese style that was pretty much it we never really saw much in the way of uh, evolution what about the what about the duke to the the Xbox S controller in the US that that's a, a good example yeah so one one other time yeah, so like we saw with the NES with the square or rectangular controllers going to the dog bone. Um, you saw like the Xbox going from the Duke to the S, which is a massive improvement. I actually kind of like the Duke a lot, but I, just personal preference, I guess. That button layout is so bizarre. <laughs> eh, I, I kind of like it. What what I would like to see is, you know, I like the 3D controller for the Saturn in that I like it as a functional controller. But it's a flying pancake, and it's not the most comfortable. And for me, neither is the Dreamcast controller. So I think it would be kind of cool to see, with modern ergonomics taken into uh, what a third generation or third revision Saturn controller would look like from these guys. You know, something that was licensed and given the okay by Sega and just kind of improved on the existing design. Well, speaking of improving on existing designs, we can roll straight into the Saturn Brawler controller, which is actually another controller for the Saturn and Genesis that was recently announced by Retro Fighters. They're the guys that made the Nintendo 64 Brawler controllers. But yeah, they just recently announced it along with the Dreamcast thing they're doing a Kickstarter for, but I think they're selling this one and they're doing a Kickstarter for the Dreamcast one. Is that sort of... Am I in the ballpark with that one? I'm not 100% yet on that. Yeah, I don't have too much information on that one yet. Like, I've seen the pictures of it, and it does look very interesting, because I think it's going to potentially feel a lot nicer in the hands than, you know, the original 3D controller. And, Pat, do you happen to know, like, is this going to be compatible with both Saturn and Genesis? Is that the is that the yeah. idea? Yeah, it's going to be a dual compatibility. And the cool thing about it is that it actually has a... It's a controller that has the digital pad and the analog stick. I guess it kind of looks like that same vein as their... N64 brawler controller, which makes me intrigued to see if this they're going to go for an all-in-one with analog compatibility with Knights and the Dreams and stuff like that, and the other games that take advantage of that analog stick. Because yeah, that would be super interesting to sort of see, you know, how it would stand up to, you know, games like Knights. This could be really handy controller to have. If it ends up being as good as, you know, it potentially could be, you know, then you have a controller that works for both Genesis and Saturn. So that's that's one that we definitely are going to follow. Yeah, definitely. It looks like there's like a little adapter that you can unhook that'll come with like a Saturn, well, what the Saturn and a uh, whatever adapter. So the Genesis nine pin. That's it. That's the word. Thank you, Kay. Yeah, be cool if they have a USB one too, so you can just hook up computer. But yeah, we should probably get in contact with these guys anyway. <laughs> yeah, I'd be down. Be like, hey, we'd love to talk to you about it, and maybe if we could test it out a little bit. I really like the design of it and the layout. It looks like it's promising if it's comfy and responsive. I've heard some good things about the N64 Brawler, but I've yet to test it, unfortunately. It looks like it's taking some design cues from the OzSoft controller. The OzSoft controllers? Yeah, I'm trying to see if I can find a picture. Yeah, those are those ones from Australia, right, Kay? Like, uh, they were official as well, but they were a slightly different, like they were a variant design almost. Something like that. They got licensed. I think that was always like a, a third-party controller that Sega just kind of put their branding on. Here is a picture of it. Oh, wow. That does actually look similar to it. So I own like four or five of these pads. They're actually kind of rare. And I got like a screaming deal on like five of them. Are they pricey controllers or is it like middle of the road? I want to say they, they are now pretty pricey, but I got them at like, I want to say 25 bucks a piece or something. Boxed. Oh, nice. How are they versus the Japanese style and the American stylized controller? I like them far better than the American style. For the Japanese style, the big weird thing about this is that this is the only official uh, controller 
licensed, etc. Uh, not like uh, official Sega branded controller that has turbo buttons, and they can make it a little odd. What do you mean by odd? Their placement. Oh, yikes. Right in the back of the controller. Yeah, so it's really easy to run your fingers over these kind of hard switches. Yeah, you're just trying to play a fighting game. All of a sudden, you're just making five million punches in a row. It's like, no. Well, the, the turbos, you know, stay. They, they do a good job at staying off. It's just like when you're holding one in your hand, depending on how you hold it, you can feel like uh, your middle and ring fingers brush against those switches. But anyway, uh, it's gotten pretty far off topic. The brawler controller looks like it takes its design cues from this Ozsoft controller. Yeah, I'm seeing it. It looks pretty interesting, though. Um, I do like how it goes away from that boomerang design. It actually goes to a... I guess it's kind of a modern-esque, you know, the two handles sort of thing, right? Yeah. I'm really excited to check it out and see how it stacks up between the RetroBit controllers and even their own brawler controller, their 64 brawler controller. I just really love how we have all these controller options now. It's never a bad thing to have options as long as they're good options, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting because this particular, you know, the brawler controller is definitely targeted for people playing Saturn or Genesis. It's not looking like it's targeted for people who want to use a Saturn or Genesis style controller on a modern console or modern system with that single analog stick i would almost be surprised if they didn't try to incorporate the dreamcast controller protocols into this as well or if they're using the same basic shell for the dreamcast version i haven't seen it yet that'd be pretty cool though because i know the dreamcast controller is pretty bad for fighting games so i know they're they're coming out with that dreamcast controller as well kickstarting that so it'd be really cool if we had that as well for some of those dreamcast games where you have one stick and the other guy gets the controller and he has to play with those digital pads and eesh. good luck buddy This is another exciting event for 2019. So this is kind of like an annual conference that Sega does in Japan. And this year, it's actually going to be themed uh, around the Sega Saturn, which is awesome. And so our very own god will be a special guest, Sega Tasanshiro, which is super exciting. Um, And he's going to be uh, on stage to interact with uh, fans during the event. And I'm really excited about this particular event uh, because Sega is going to be, or at least they're scheduled to, make announcements to or updates to previously announced Switch releases. So they've got that on their schedule. And so it's really exciting. I mean, with this being themed around the Sega Saturn, it kind of makes you wonder whether they're going to, you know, announce any sort of ports or, you know, other Saturn-based titles for the Switch. So... You know, we're going to have to wait and see what they announce on that, but that's that's definitely got me excited. Yeah, I was I was looking at that. One of the things I think we're definitely going to hear about is the Panzer Dragoon uh, remake that they announced. I guess, was it Sega or was it just another company that announced that they were working on that? I'm pretty sure that it was the other organization that announced that they were working on it. Yeah, I couldn't see Sega not advertising it during the, the Sega conferences, so... I can definitely see that, and I'm kind of excited to see if the prospect and maybe we can get a sequel to one of these games. Like maybe another, you know, potentially Knights game, or maybe even something like Left Field. Well, it does seem like Sega's really looking hard at their, uh, you know, back catalog of all their intellectual properties. I mean, I know that uh, fairly recently they put out a, a survey for Sega fans to sort of go in and fill out, and it was centered all around their... Um, you know, their classic IPs. So so maybe they see that, you know, this is a viable sort of business revenue stream for them. And, you know, to me, that's great. I mean, the more of those uh, classic IPs and franchises that they revive, the better. Yeah, definitely. Kind of excited to see how much Saturn news is coming out with this stuff. I mean, we had Sega, we have all these developments coming out and Saturn is just picking up so much traction. I talked with Ben a little bit about the possibility of going in a half-joking manner. If there was to have been an event that I would have liked to have gone to Japan to see, this is probably very high on the list, particularly with Hiroshi Fujioka reprising his role as Sagata Sanchiro and reflecting on, you know, like the 25 year history of the Saturn. It seems like it's right up our alley, you know, being this very niche news outlet slash podcast. I'd like to have seen it. Uh, It happens the same day as Cowlitz, though. So, 
I gotcha. Well, I imagine that we're uh, that everyone else at Cheer will keep an, a close eye on it and be dropping news. But yeah, I'd, I'm with you though. I'd love to go, but I do not have the money to fly to Japan. So some of the more interesting things that they uh, look like they're mentioning is they're doing uh, something with Fantasy Star, and uh, they're having a Puyo Puyo Championships going on over there, and they're going to talk about some of the Sega Ages updates that have been announced on the Switch. So it's kind of kind of cool and i'm sure there's going to be lots of celebrating and there is going to be a live stream from looks like 10 to 12 30 and from 12 30 to uh, 1800 was that six o'clock <laughs> yep yeah it's something to to watch out if you happen to be a fan of the saturn or of sega's endeavors in general and uh, check that out yeah, and depending on what's announced and what's talked about, we might have to do an emergency update cast if that's the case, so we'll have to keep your eyes peeled on that. So why don't we move on to our main topic, which is going to be fanlation projects. And you might be asking, what's a fanlation project? So it's basically just a combination of fan projects, translation projects. So anything where it's a, I guess, a fan endeavor to try to get these games going on Saturn in a way. So everything from new games to translations to conversions of older games. Why don't we start with the most well-known one, the hottest item on the the market today, which is uh, Link a Liver Story. So I guess for those of you that don't know about it, there's recently Ashiha. Is that how you pronounce it? Ashaha. But anyways, for Link of Liver Story, both the game and menu have gotten an English translation by Aisha, Paul Met, and Pennywise. I guess, essentially, for those who don't know, it's sort of a Link to the Past style game, and I guess more Secret of Mana. What do you guys think? Secret of Mana or Link to the Past feeling? Oh man, that's tough. I mean, it's probably a bit of both. I really like the colors in it. It's very sort of vibrant. I've only actually played the uh, Japanese version. I've not yet played the patched English version. So, you know, all of my sort of impressions are from from that game. The one thing that I kind of noticed when I played through the game, and I haven't gone to the end yet, but it at times seemed to have, you know, a skipping frame rate. And I mean, I don't know if that was just, you know, my imagination or if that's an actual issue. But in any event, the game seemed really interesting. You know, definitely the uh, anime style characters, the really vibrant colors, really awesome, you know, pixel artwork. So it's definitely a game that I'm going to be spending some time with. I was really interested in it. And what I didn't know is actually... It's a spiritual successor to Crusaders of Senti on the Genesis or Mega Drive, depending on what country you live in. That's neat. I actually didn't know that. And I actually know there's one other thing. I didn't um, I, I didn't get a chance to smell the game yet. So I, I, have, <laughs> to my, I have to hold my nasal review. I give it a 6 out of 10 on the nasal. It's kind of old. so. But anyways, the first time I heard about it was on a obscure list of obscure Saturn games that are in, playable in English on a some random internet forum and i was like oh cool that sounds like a cool game link a liver story so i picked it up for like maybe like two bucks on ebay or something i originally was getting it a bundle but they didn't have it so i picked it up and i got i got pretty decently far in it but unfortunately i couldn't go on i was unable to know what's going on but now that they have the translation i'm really excited to try it out have you got any experience using it to, or playing it Kay? No, it, this has been on the list of games that I've been told would be really easy to play without having a deep knowledge of Japanese. And as such, it's kind of been on the outskirts of my consciousness. What's interesting to me is more about the technical aspect is that Paul Met being involved uh, in the project. Paul Met has done amazing hacking work on Saturn software. He is the primary spearhead for any of the 3D games that have had change of aspect ratio to widescreen. So, you know, going from 4x3 to 16x9, been fantastic work. I do a repro of Panzer Dragoon Saga that is properly set in uh, 16x9 because of Paul Met. He's just been instrumental in figuring out what games are uh, able to be patched to change the view that the end user sees. 
So, and it's primarily like 3D games. In fact, I think they're all 3D games that he's worked on. And it, it kind of makes sense when you think about it, since a lot of the 3D based games have a sort of a camera and you're looking, you know, from the view of the camera behind the player. So like third party or third person perspective. And he was able to find the right places within a lot of the software to patch or change or hex edit to allow an expansion of the view that you see. So, yeah, and he's done some some incredible work uh, on other things, too. Like, he has a, a higher resolution hack, I think, of the story of Thor 2, which we got as, what, Legend of Oasis. Paul Met working on this is, is pretty awesome to see. I would say I'm a, a little bit of a fanboy of his work from the technical aspect of things. And from what I played for the English patch, it was really interesting. I only played a couple minutes of it unfortunately but i went to a little bit uh, about about the game on the um saturn titan cast a little bit when they had me over there and it, it was pretty interesting we should definitely have paul on here sometime it'd probably be great to talk to you about those two things one last thing i'm going to mention about uh link liver is uh, i find it interesting that the folks that translated it decided to sort of stick with the japanese title the link liver been a lot of talk about you know whether that should translate to wrinkle river but instead it's been kept as Linkle liver and you know that may be sort of an odd title if you aren't aware of sort of how that came about but Linkle liver it is so yeah on the side of my game disc it actually says Linkle liver story on the actual saturn box art i'm kind of more leaning towards Linkle liver story just because i mean if it's on the original box art and that's sort of what their intention is and they even have it on the uh, the back of it. They have the logo of it, Linkle Liver Story, and this awful uh, 3D designed logo. Oh yeah, for sure. It definitely does uh, say Linkle Liver in it. Like, I guess uh, my question was um, whether that was intentional or whether that was just a really bad translation. Whether they were intending to go for Wrinkle River and just it ended up being Linkle Liver. And you know, we'll probably never know. But it, it's just neat that it, you know, when the game was uh, patched and translated, it was uh, kept as Linkle Liver. So the story that I've seeing you know within the rom hacking forums about that and also like this came from paul met uh, himself in this is that lingle liver does not appear anywhere in the game or in the manual whatsoever at all so there isn't uh any reason for them to go for anything else one way or the other well i mean it's on the box art like on on the actual side art and on the back of the game right like so it, there's going to be, you know, um, debate about whether they were trying to, like, call it something generic or if they, it was like a, a bad, like, English uh, translation. But what the point that they were making was is that when they translated the manual and they translated, you know, inside the game, there's no mentions of the word linkel or liver or anything that remotely um, would give someone the idea of calling it something besides Linkle Liver. Like, the, the words don't ever show up anywhere within the actual game. That's interesting. Hmm. It reminds me of uh, back in the day when they released Lupin the Third in the U.S. on Laserdisc. It was actually titled Rupin the Third, or Rupon, however you pronounce it, the Third. I just think it's really funny how that they still have that those issues, even up to the early 90s with a company like Sega itself. This is uh, something cool for... The community to get uh it, it is a interesting very colorful looking game i am more likely to play it now that's you know available in english than i would have been you know any time prior to that yeah and you know our very own dave actually has come out with a really awesome looking um reproduction case for link liver and he actually even does uh the discs for him too they look really slick he's done them in the style of existing north american templates so you know it would look on your shelf it would look perfectly at home with the rest of your official releases. I really admire Dave's work for this, and one of the things that really draws me to what uh, Dave is able to produce is the fact that he really takes great care to make sure that any of the uh, art that he uses or logos or anything like that are um, correct to the uh, time frame in which the game would have released. So, you know, from details like, you know, whether he includes the uh, barbershop stripes 
on the uh, North American cases and manuals or not, because, of course, the later Saturn releases didn't have them. So he pays attention to little things like that. You know, if companies that uh, are still around to this day, if they have at some point changed their logos or redesigned their logos or anything like that, um, I noticed that Dave always makes sure that he uses the logos that were current, you know, back in... Uh, back in the time period. So so his work is really fantastic. Um, I know he's put out um, copies for folks that want to get their hands on this stuff. So he's kind of got a liver list going. So for folks that have expressed interest in, you know, getting uh, their hands on Dave's repro, uh, he's got them on the list and he's just very methodically and meticulously going through uh, and producing those and then uh, shipping them out to folks. And I think, Kay, I think he also uh, donated a whole bunch of copies uh, to you, uh, did he not? And if you could just tell us about that a little bit. Yeah, people know uh, if they've been following along with us since the get-go. I am involved in the Cowlitz Gamers for Kids uh, Expo, and it is happening as of this recording in about eight days Expo put together for the benefit of children in the Longview and Cowlitz County area uh, in Washington. The last couple of years, it's been to benefit the Ark of Cowlitz County, which, or I guess it, maybe it's Ark of Longview. But they um, support the autistic children's uh, community there. Near and dear to my heart and near and dear to the hearts of others in the Northwest community, uh, particularly John Hancock, Jonathan Rose. And so when... When Lincoln Liver's translation dropped originally, I was going to try and do a repro myself. And I saw Dave's work with the full long box cases, and I'm not set up to do long boxes just yet. And I asked him, you know, if he'd be willing to put some of his work up for a very limited release special from the other editions he was doing for Cowlitz. And he agreed to do it. So I have in my possession right now I think about 10 copies that are going to be exclusive to Cowlitz Gamers for Kids. Very mild changes from the ones that he's reducing for everyone else. Um, there's going to be like, you know, hand numbered and all of them have the Cowlitz Gamers for Kids logo on them, both in, I think on the manual and on the disc itself. And then I think we also did kind of like an either an introduction or a dedication page in the manual specific about, you know, talking about the people who've been helping to run Cowlitz all these times. Nice. Um, and is that going to be up for auction, or is that going to just be for general sale? They were going to have them set up for general sale. One is going into the silent auction that is there for Cowlitz. So basically how, how we're trying to do exclusives like this, the number one version of any run tends to go into the auctions, uh, allowing people like who absolutely have to have the number one version, number one of 20 or however many it ends up being for that run, that ends up going to the highest bidder. And then the rest of them are going to be at, they'll either be at my table or at Khaled's table with the other exclusives, whichever way we end up doing that. And all of the proceeds from that are going directly into Khaled's Gamers for Kids to be able to help with the arc of Khaled County. Yeah, and I'm going to get this podcast up before that date, hopefully by the end of this weekend, which is the weekend of the 22nd. I'm going to let you guys know, if you guys are interested in getting this and helping a good cause, I would recommend, if you're in that in the Seattle area, I would go to Kellett's and pick up these copies because it's going for a really good cause and it's a really well-designed work. And big thanks to Dave for doing it because he volunteered his time and his materials. Yes, big thank you to Dave. So now that we've talked about Linkle Liver for a bit, next game that has kind of had a, a large amount of attention in a very short amount of time, Ninpin Monmaru, also known as, it's been called a couple of things, but it's like Monmaru the Ninja Penguin or Ninja Penguin Monmaru, depending on who you ask. It's, it's one of those name things. It's a, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting game. It's a, based off of the manga of the same name by author, or if you're an otaku like me, mangaka, Mikio Igarashi. That ran from about 1995 to 1999, which I actually didn't know about. Did you know that, Kay? No, I'm, I'm going to bite the bullet and go down with the ship on this one. Outside of knowing that it is an expensive game and a really easy game to play, I knew little to nothing about this game. So this gave me a, a nice bit of education. It's really cool. It was developed by, by Enix, famed for, of course, their Dragon Quest series, Star Ocean series, and Ogre Battle, and many 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 more that i imagine i'm gonna get flamed at for for letting out 
You know, back in the day, I know that uh, Enix was actually a very late comer to Saturn development. And so Ninja Penguin was their first uh, Saturn release. And it did come sort of in the later half of the uh, Saturn's life cycle. It, of course, never came out anywhere but in Japan. And I've had a chance to, to play the game uh, for quite some time. And it's a cutesy Japanese game. You're obviously, you know, the Ninja Penguin. And it's fully 3D. So, you know, you get to sort of jump around a 3D environment. Lots of uh, item collecting. You know, lots of platforming. Which uh, is a little bit challenging because, you know, the camera views have to continually be adjusted. There's a lot of, it's very sort of up and down, so you're constantly climbing, there are moving platforms, so it's a very interesting uh, little game, and the cutscenes are really well done, it's it's just, it's really cool. And it was nice to see that uh, Enix jumped into the uh, Saturn scene when they did, and uh, now this game, you know, rests in our hands, and it's translated, and I think it's just really fun. Kay actually let me know that, that this is actually isn't Enix's first game. That was the their first game actually was Natsuyu Kaze no Shima Monogatari. Oh, you're right. That's right. Yeah, Monogatari. Okay, I forgot about that. And you know, Dave actually did some let's plays uh, of that game. So we've got archive footage of that as well, and that's an interesting title in and of itself. But anyways, I'm getting a little bit sidetracked. But yes, okay. So I stand corrected. So it's uh, Enix's second Saturn title. Yeah, it's, the both of those games look really cool. I I haven't played the the first one, but I, I have played the Ninja Penguin and it kind of reminds me a little bit of a mixture of Croc and Jumping Flash a bit, if you can see where I'm going with that, where it's sort of like that overhead position, that early 3D platformer. Yep, I can definitely see that. And that's an interesting comparison to Croc. I find it to be a little bit more blocky than Croc. And I don't mean in terms of, you know, the graphics are, are very blocky, but just the structures and the platforms are definitely uh, designed as blocky, whereas Croc is a little bit softer on the edges. But yeah, that's a that's a pretty fair uh, game to uh, compare it to, is like a cross between Croc and Jumping Flash. It's one of those games that's considered, you know, playable without knowing any Japanese, because it's a platformer. It is gotten crazy expensive last checked. I haven't checked myself in a while. This is one that I would, this has been a lot closer to my radar because of the price jumps in it over the last few years. Just doing a quick eBay search on it. Prices right now ranging between 75 bucks plus shipping to about 140 I actually see a buy it now for that game for $2,229.60. Wow, that does not pass the smell test. Nope, that's native smells. Well, So there is a sealed one right now going for $764.36 or best offer. And that's 25% off of their like $1,000 price. Oh, wow, that's a good deal. I mean, I think everyone should go invest in it right now. Next solid gold. That'll be our currency in the apocalypse. There's copies of Ninpen Manamaru. <laughs> that joke fell flat. I'm cutting that one out. Did you guys have any uh, any thoughts of the game itself? My two cents here is that it's actually fairly fun, but it's, I think, going to be more fun for folks that primarily play games from this era. So if you're used to modern 3D designs and all the rest of it, then this is going to look fairly dated. But if you primarily play, you know, Saturn or, you know, PlayStation, Nintendo 64, whatever, then this is going to be pretty fun. It's interesting what uh, what was done in this game. And, you know, now that it's in English, there's really no better no better time to, to give it a try. For me, again, knowledge on this game is more on the technical side related to the patch. So people are claiming that this is some sort of like new release. The fact of the matter is, is that this translation patch was not complete. And to my knowledge, still remains incomplete. It was originally worked out by a guy with the handle of Alex Kidd in May of 2001. This was some time ago. If you look hard enough for you know information about the translation patch, you'll find a couple of websites, including where Alex Kidd first dropped the patch. This is back in the time period where doing a patch, like it, just about any Saturn game that you found was done in ISO plus MP3 or ISO plus WAV format something that you know to us uh, in the modern age kind of finds archaic and like oh my god <laughs> you guys did that you know it was the feudal japan of the internet back then <laughs> <laughs> 
But Alex Kidd did the original patch, and about a year ago, Cafe Alpha, who is the current holder of the Pseudo Saturn software, like Pseudo Saturn Kai specifically, and also the creator of the Saturn Gamers Cart, he reworked the patch to make it a little bit more friendly, uh, use it with a utility. And then he also hosted the original uh, project page on his website. So what's interesting about this is that it's been sitting around. It's not been hidden anywhere. There just hasn't been a lot of excitement over this game and, and the, the English translation. In all fairness, though, the game itself is not really much to write home about in general. So, I mean, I can see why. It, it just has been sitting around for almost 20 years. And what happened was in the past couple of weeks, certain parties have done a physical reproduction. A friend of the cast, a friend of mine, Sasha Rydell from Facebook, got a hold of the party that released this uh, recently, pointed them to Cafe Alpha's page. And my understanding is that that party failed to be able to patch the game themselves, took it to someone else to get it patched, and then presented it to the world. Sasha I've known for a while, and he is a big fan of Saturn games in general. He likes anything that he can find translated or anything that's been unreleased. And he likes having physical copies of this. So it makes sense that he went to someone who's kind of known in the community as mostly doing reproductions. So I talked with Sasha, I don't know, was it um, the 17th? And he pointed me to the translation patch I was like, oh, yeah, I remember seeing this, but I didn't care at the time. So I worked on it for maybe about an hour, hour and a half, uh, put it together and put it out without worry about anything really related to reproductions or anything else. I just felt that it's most important to get it out to the community and gave proper credit to both Cafe Alpha and Sasha for you know pointing me in the direction to get this out there. My main thing is that we have this as a pre-patched disc image now directly because of the work of people like Sasha, like Cafe Alpha, this forgotten hacker named Alex Kidd. And I'm happy to, to you know, give them the credit and push that work out because I think that it's really the only way that this community is ever going to survive. You know, is if new things or things that are obscure are brought to the surface and made available for free. Exactly. Glad that this is out there and that a ROM... Well, a translation patch that literally was being made while I was learning multiplication tables is now out there for everyone to try after, what, 18 years? So, yeah, big thank you for Alex Kidd for all his hard work. You know, maybe we can track him down and get him on the cast, see what's going on, get some updates. It'd be really interesting to see. I mean, he basically disappeared 15 years ago. It's like we had to hunt him down. Yeah, because, I mean, that long of a time frame. I mean, Alex Kidd is probably Alex Mann these days, so... <laughs> Alex, father of three. <laughs> yeah, you never know. You never know. Ho hopefully he's doing well either way. Absolutely. Kind of morbid if he's not around anymore. No, he's he's probably somewhere like, you know, just doing his own thing. I mean, you know, I mean, it happens to us all the time. We leave internet forums, have old handles, you know. I mean, he could still be among us with some other name. He should claim his work, you know, if he is still around. And thank you to his work. Thank you to Cafe Alpha for preserving this and thank you to sasha for bringing it to light because without sasha this would not have turned into this big giant thing including long box reproductions by our friend dave wink 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 he did actually do a i guess a pseudo reproduction for his own use right now so he didn't make a full manual just the basic design right now but i think he has interest in doing it i haven't talked to him yet but it seems like there is i guess there's some interest of him and people that want to see it but you know at this point i mean dave's work is of such high quality that i mean it doesn't matter what game he covers it i have yet to come across a piece of work by dave that you know i'm not impressed by i mean that guy is just a wizard i think hands down that three of the best people that do repros in the community have to be of course uk dave and ben boyd you guys put so much effort into your work and it's like ridiculous i love ben's work i love what dave's doing i've had like a kind of a recent you know like internal talk with myself about whether or not i'm going to continue to do actions right the main problem being that when i started this we weren't looking at relatively inexpensive plastic long boxes being available and therefore i never really had a desire to make 
you know, designs that were set to fit in a long box. I also have a, a very different philosophy, I think, than Dave does, which makes it kind of you know interesting to see the two different points of view. Dave is going after that authenticity, right? He wants it to look just like it did, as if it would have being like a proper, you know, someone's going to get the right word for me at some point. Time accurate. Time accurate. Thank you. Yes. Uh, time accurate production as if Sega had published it or it had been licensed appropriately. And I never wanted a single one of my discs to be mistaken for something that actually came out. I have a, a strong feeling about the idea that I don't want anyone to get swindled. I don't want someone to be handed this thing that looks authentic and you know be told that this you know is a real game and it's worth hundreds of dollars because no one has it, that sort of thing. Our different philosophies have kind of led us in different directions in the reproduction world. I want to do long boxes now that it's possible, but you know the amount of work to go back to all of my old stuff and remake it to fit the long box and still also be able to do DVD cases, it's going to be a while before I get to that point. In the meantime, you know, for those people who want something that looks perfectly aligned with everything else that they have on their shelf, Dave does work second to none. Even his discs, like the common way of doing discs is through, uh, you know, a printer that can print directly to disc, be it like back in the day, Lightscribe, or you can use like uh, certain printers from Canon. I think there's a Pixima 930 or something like that, where you drop it into the ink jet tray and you'll get a lot of mileage variants, you know, depending on what kind of disc you use. Dave's process is different. You know, he prints to a special kind of labeling system and applies it very similar to old school it looks fantastic it it looks like it almost could have been a press job or a silk screen job the way that they were done back in that time period Dave's one biggest thing is that he you know works doing that sort of stuff as a full-time job he probably has that experience with that the one thing I like about yours though is that you're all high quality and like there's no wrong answers with these repros I mean each one of them looks good for their own reasons you know you know one other thing i'm going to mention about dave's work and that just goes back to your point k because i agree i don't think it's you know right or fair for folks to be uh you know mistaken that you know this was an actual release or that it's potentially a super expensive game so you know dave does put the uh sega saturn shiro logo on there and you know it clearly says that this is a custom and he's got that you know in several places in his manuals as well as on the actual discs themselves so even though they look super authentic in every way possible, um, he does differentiate them, you know, in several different places, just so that that, you know, accidental confusion doesn't doesn't happen. Yeah, and I've talked with, with Dave about this um, very recently. One of the things is that I guess came to a mutual conclusion on is that there are certain rules for reproduction makers at some of the bigger conventions now, um, namely Portland Retro Gaming Expo. His set as it is right now would probably not be able to be sold at PRGE because it doesn't have like a clear marker showing like the words, this is a reproduction. In all the discs that I had to sell at the last PRGE, I actually had to put in like a red box, this is a reproduction so that it was eye catching and drew, you know, the attention. Not every place is going to be like that. And for people who just want something that looks good on their shelves, you know, he does have the Sega Saturn Shiro Customs logo on it. It's very subtle. It's not going to be, you know, eye drawing. So it's not going to draw attention away from the rest of the work or the overall aesthetic. It just kind of looks like another logo. And I will tell you that between what I would want on my shelf versus what I want to put out in the world, I personally would rather have one of Dave's you know, pieces of work because they, they look that good that they could be mistaken for authentic if you did not know. You know, I, I like doing full disc art for everything and, and like having a, a different kind of theme to the, the front style. I will admit I'm not a big fan of the long box style of artwork. Never have been and never will be. I think it was a waste of a, a lot of space. You know, like there's a lot of white space there that could be utilized for more of an image. Or, or cases that are actually good, right? <laughs> yeah, but it, this is one of these weird debates like what I want on my shelf versus what I want to put out in the world, right? I mean, it's all down to personal preference, though. I mean, there's, like, no wrong answers, in a way. It's all down to what you think is best, what you like, what's more convenient. 
I mean, because, you know, maybe that might be more accurate, but if you're space saving, you might want a DVD case or something that still looks nice, but, you know, is not 25 million feet tall. And I guess what it kind of comes down to is the uh, things like stadium events, right? I had a reproduction of stadium events that I picked up from my buddy Emilio. And nowhere on the label did it say it was reproduction, it, but it was pretty obvious that this is not a real stadium events. I was happy with it because it was just going to sit on my shelf. It's not going to you know, get sold. It really just comes down to like, can we trust the ethics you know, and the morality of the community to not go and take Dave's work and try to pass it to someone else as you know, something a real or authentic and we saw like, there were people who took the Nights into Dreams design that he did for Christmas Nights and started selling it on Etsy and on eBay just because they could. I'm hoping that his work gets to stay with him and the fans of, of that style, that authentic long box US style, having something that matches everything else on your shelf. Dave has got you covered. He does fantastic work. The best, the best reproduction work I've ever seen. All right, so that being said about Ninpen, uh, Manmaru, um, we have noticed that Daniel Smith's group, Sega Saturn Gamers and Collectors, I think it is, has been largely involved in hyping up Ninpen Manmaru as part of their new games that are being released for Saturn. And you know, we wanted to acknowledge this game that dropped today from them. This is a port of Out of This World, which was known as Another World in Europe. And this port is uh, actually the engine to run it. It came out by HKZ Lab. It was first posted in SegaExtremes.net's forums back in September 21st of 2009. The port did not originally include the game files because they were wanting to make sure that they stayed on the very legal side of things. And the port was originally shared at RapidShare, which is no longer a thing. If you read through that form, we'll have a link in our various posts when we drop this podcast. But you'll also find that HKZ Lab had been working on the Flashback port as well, both of those for the Saturn. So there's potential that Flashback is also able to be played on the Saturn? Uh, it's more than just potential. I know it exists. Okay, cool. Yeah. And so I would not be too surprised if that might end up being the third game that gets dropped by Daniel Smith's group, the Collectors and Gamers group. I do want to give credit where credit is due. They have released today, properly released the disc image that's supposedly already compiled. I have played that disc image um, in an emulator, and it works just fine. Definitely looks like it's the IBM version, the PC version of the game, and then the engine ported to support it. Yeah, one thing I thought was interesting about is that the guy that made it, Eric Clutchy or whatever his name is, also worked on Heart of Darkness, which is, funny enough, a unreleased Saturn game, too. Yeah, yeah, we released or leaked uh, Heart of Darkness on Christmas uh, in memory of Dawn, and I'm sure that we'll be able to get the people links to that uh, release as well. Gotcha. Is that the one that's playable, or is that the one that requires the 16 megabyte cart? It's playable in an emulator, but it has to use a 16 megabyte cart. So yeah, I don't want to give too much you know excitement to this. It it's been around for about 10 years, and it's nothing new. It's a, a port of a game that had you know come out ages ago. I think that it's cool and exciting for people who missed out the first time around to be able to play it on the Saturn. And for all information that I've received, having not actually played it on a real Saturn yet, it plays pretty well. HKZ Lab did include the original source code for it, so you could tinker with it if anyone wanted to optimize it. I don't know if the recent release, you know, the one that came out this week, includes those source code files or not. It'd be really interesting to see. Um, from what I could tell, it's just the disk image. I'm not really well versed in the game, to be honest. You know, just a quick observation, it just, uh, it's sort of like, it's almost like a cel-shaded graphic style, and unless I'm mistaken, that's fairly unique on the Saturn. Like, I mean, that got popular uh, later on in future generations, that sort of graphic style, but I don't think we see that anywhere on the Saturn. So it's just sort of neat to see that that sort of art style on the Saturn. But to be fair, I have not played the game myself yet, so this is just sort of an observation based on things I've seen on uh, on the web.
let us talk about things that are upcoming. So Lunar, Silver Star Story. Thank you. I can't say that without having a tongue twister. Pretty exciting that, you know, a translation of this is uh, coming out. I mean, obviously this game was uh, originally a Saturn game and it was eventually ported to the PlayStation. Uh, But of course, only the PlayStation port uh, ever showed up in English. So now there's work being done on retranslating the Lunar, the Silver Star story uh, for the Saturn. So that's exciting. It was originally put out on the Sega CD. You know what, Kay, you're right, and I believe the Saturn versions of both Silver Star Story and the sequel Eternal Blue, they were sort of like remakes, right? Yes. Um, Because you're right, the originals were by Game Arts on Sega CD, and then they were remade for the Saturn and eventually ported to the PlayStation. Yes. But it was the Saturn versions that were ported to the PS1, right? Correct. Yeah, so and then over and above that, there was a Saturn exclusive game by the name of Lunar Magic School. And so that's never seen the light of day anywhere outside of Japan either. And I know that that's being worked on as well. So both those games, super high quality. And, you know, it's exciting to know that that's definitely coming out in the Saturn's future. Yeah, I mean, the Saturn's our future at this point. Um, (laughs) But but, uh, the, the cool thing about it, the cool thing about it is that they're working on both a VCD version and a regular version patch for it. So if you want to play the, the VCD with the higher quality cutscenes or you don't have a VCD, you just want to play regular Lunar, which why would you want to do that when you have the high quality VCD version? But yeah, no, it's it's cool because they're ripping stuff directly from the PS1. So I believe they're using the dubbed cutscenes from Working Designs. So that's going to be pretty interesting. They said that they basically have 90% of the cutscenes retimed for the dub. Uh, they're able to insert text in the game, update the fonts to the higher quality. Translation's still in progress, but they're having some issues with some of the FMVs that weren't included or were modified for the PS1 release. So I'm pretty excited to see when this drops because I love Lunar. Oh yeah, for sure. I actually know just as a general comment, I find it uh, sort of fascinating that the games that are getting the translation treatments are overwhelmingly text heavy. So, you know, we're talking about RPGs and things like Mm -hmm. that. I think that there's a ton of games that would be way, way faster to translate that would be definitely worth releasing out here in the West. But I mean, obviously RPGs are uh, definitely a passion of mine. It's just, it's, I find it neat that, you know, folks are going after the super intense and difficult projects. Well, you know, it's where their their heart lies, right? And one of the things that was said about the Lunar series, uh, the reason why the uh, gal who is putting it out you know, wanted to do it is to have all the Lunar games on a single platform. You know, so that's that's kind of cool. But this kind of like paints a, a little bit about why I'm such a fan of the Rhea or the Phoebe over the original proposition with the Sadiator, or however you say it. And that's because Lunar Silver Star Story Complete, the MPEG edition, requires the MPEG card to be put in. So if we don't get that functionality you know, out of the Sadiator, then this is one translation project you can't play on you know that version of that software. Now granted, it's one title, and you'll have other options, but this is the kind of thing where It's never a good idea, in my opinion, to remove a feature or take away a feature, you know, whether it be on accident or as a side effect. Yeah, without that MPEG card, I mean, it's still obviously a good game and it only will affect the uh, cutscenes, but it just doesn't smell as nice uh, without the card. Oh my gosh, Peter, is this going to be a thing? (laughs) Listen, a lot of people sniff their games when they open it up. It's not a weird thing, okay, guys? Not at all. It just smells fishy. <laughs> All right. Um, well, I can smell your hate from here. Do you smell well, what Pat is cooking? Right oh, now? God. Quick side note. Uh, when I first cut my hair, I kind of thought I looked like The Rock, which is kind of silly if you know what I look like, but just thought I want to throw that out there. Uh, anyways. Did you know he went to my intermediate school like five years before I did? Oh, that, that makes sense because he's from originally from Hawaii, right? Mm-hmm. Let's talk a little bit about two other games that are being worked on. Grandia and Sakura Wars. Yeah, I thought the Grandia one was really interesting, especially since I don't really think... At first I was thinking why, but then I realized, oh yeah, the Grandia 2 was on the 
the Dreamcast, so it'd be kind of a nice parallel to have both of them in a way. And ag- again, interestingly, Grandia is another Game Arts uh, title. So when Game Arts was finished with the Lunar games, you know, the, their next big RPG was Grandia. And again, it was first released on Saturn, eventually ported to the PlayStation. It came out on the Saturn in 1997. And it was, you know, it was touted as competition for Final Fantasy VII. And really, a lot of folks back in the day felt that it was just such a solid game that it really gave uh, FF7, you know, a run for its money. And it did eventually get a PlayStation port in 99, and, and that made its way over here in English. So, you know, the game is currently playable in English on the PlayStation, but the Saturn version is technically superior. And so it, it would be so, so cool to get Grandia out here in in English, because it's definitely one of the Saturn's premier RPGs, hands down. Yeah, and, and the cool thing is that it, it basically uses a lot of the PS1 assets, so looking at the, the notes of the guys that were doing this, they said that they use a lot of the PS1 assets to assist in it, and pulling the data to get, you know, different translation and, and data in places that needs to go, because apparently the file formats are very similar, but yeah, apparently they completely converted the ps1 script over to the saturn format hopefully that'll speed things up but i still still run into some translation issues and a uh, font size fitting into the ram of the saturn that's given it some issues it's really cool i'm excited to play that do you have any experience playing grandia okay no not not one i really got into oddly enough i uh, i was actually really into lunar on the uh, playstation and I got to the second disc, and it ate my save, and I just lost all interest. <laughs> so I kind of have a feeling like, you know, a lot of these really text-heavy RPGs from the mid to late 90s that I haven't played before are probably never going to actually hit my playlist. Which, you know, and I know I'm limiting myself in that respect, and I know I have Grandia 2 for the Dreamcast somewhere, but it just, like, weird to me to play the sequel when I hadn't played the first one, you know? Yeah, I, I don't blame you, Kay, though. I mean, nowadays, I don't have time for 80-hour RPGs. Like, I'm still getting pushed for, like, Persona and stuff, so it's like, no, I'd rather just play, like, a shmup or something, so... So, just to, to kind of give everyone uh, context, the last update happened on February 9th as to what was going on with the Grandia translation. It looks like they've kind of ran themselves into a little bit of trouble, you know, issues with some of the, the work that they've been doing where they're not getting the results quite where they want to. How much progress has been made in such a short amount of time is very interesting to me. And if you look through the thread, I believe the second person to comment is Paul Met. <laughs> Jeez, Mr. Polly. Oh, no, along came Polly. Paul met, uh, you know, giving some pointers about font sizes and what he was able to do with it thus far. And he is definitely, in in my opinion, one of the um, Saturn software hacking aficionados. I know many cool things that he's done. The, the team that he works with, like Team Medusa, really cool stuff. So I hope that, you know, the primary person working on this translation keeps up you know, is able to power through problems that they're doing or, or running into and that we actually get to see this come to fruition. Definitely. And if you're listening right now, Sega Saturn Shiro would, you know, love to have this uh, game out. And I know so would the community. And so we're all rooting for you. Yes, please. I want to play Grandia. So please. The other big bigger name that's kind of been on the list as of recently and we've touched on it a couple of times but that was sakura wars a very interesting game for those of you that don't know it's a turn-based rpg it's kind of like a mixture of feudal japan and mech robots is the best way i can describe it uh for years people have been playing it with you know the translation notes online but obviously you need a computer or you know your phone nearby to play it But now, uh, apparently, Noah Steam has started on a translation for it quite recently. I think we talked about it. Was it towards the end of 18? Was that when we were talking about it? Or was that mid-18? I can't remember. I want to say it was towards the end. I gotcha. They're about... Currently, the last update I checked is that they're about two-thirds of the story dialogue done. And it looks like they're sourcing it out through different people. So, currently, they have 36 files completed, 14 in progress, and 6 remaining. So, and translated. Hopefully, with that progress, we can get it done pretty fast. But 
Looks like what they have remaining is patching menus, patching the intro subtitles, patching the battle menus, improving the look of the font, and then fixing the displays with lips events. Besides that, I'm really excited to play. Did you guys ever try to play that at all? So I do have the Japanese version, and I have to admit I've not yet given it a go. It's sort of on my to play list. Uh, but it does look fascinating. I've actually got the first and the second、uh, and the sequel. And so, you know, at some point I'll get to them. And, and if I could,、uh, you know, get them to play in English, that would be fantastic. The special edition that came with the mouse pad and the mouse. That's like my official mouse pad for my computer now. That's awesome. Oh, that's sweet. All right, one other big game that、uh, we know is in the works、uh, in terms of an English translation is Princess Crown. Now, I, I don't have too many updates as to where that project is at, but for those of you that don't know, Princess Crown、um, is an Atlas game, and it's very much in the style of games like Odin Sphere and also、uh, Miramasa the Demon Blade. Odin Sphere, of course, came out on PS2, and Miramasa was a Wii game. And so, you know, it's definitely in that art style, and so it looks really, really good as a Saturn release. And it's just a very fascinating little game. It's side scrolling beat em up, I guess is the best way to describe it. And yeah, so I mean, this is yet another candidate for a title that is potentially going to make it out、um, as a translated English game. And that's definitely what I'm looking forward to. It's, it's not one of the cheaper、uh, games to import、uh, from Japan. So, you know, having the ability to, to play a, a patched English version is definitely appealing to me. Do you guys have any experience with、uh, Princess Crown? So. Princess Crown has been worked on off and on by Cyber Warrior X, God, for at least four plus years. I think he started mentioning it back in like 2013. Cyber Warrior X is,、uh, as mentioned at that point, he was instrumental in bringing forth、uh, Pseudo Saturn as a、um, proof of concept demo.、Um, and then what we actually got is the first version of, of Pseudo Saturn. So he's been involved in the The hacking and insertion aspect of things. Apparently, translation is being handled by a gentleman named Sam I Am, and Cafe Alpha is working on this as well. The last commit in their GitHub was about two months ago. It happened on January 19th, and it was an update to the README file. Didn't look like a whole lot has happened with the actual project files, but it is still being actively worked on, at the very least, by those three gentlemen. I actually never heard of this game until you guys recently bring it up, and it seems pretty interesting. It's like a side scroller RPG in a way, and I'm actually kind of excited to try this out. Yeah, it looks really good. I think Dragon's Crown is like a spiritual successor, if you guys have played that. I don't think I have. What's that on? PlayStation consoles, so、uh, PS Vita, PS3. Good to know that that's still a thing. And we're not trying to be exhaustive here. We wanted to touch on like, some of the most popular ones. There are tons of translation projects in various states, some announced, some not announced. You can find out more simply by you know, going to ROM hacking and looking at the various things that are available there. And the other aspects of, of these hacks that are being put out, there is a, an emulator for, I, I believe it was the either Sega Master System or maybe it was like the S. Uh, SG or SC 1000 that was ported to the Saturn, so you could play a, a bunch of you know, games from a completely different console. And that came out ages ago. There are fan projects out there like the Shenmue RPG mini RPG that was done as a tech demo by Titan Studios. You know, really small, barely anything more than a tech demo. Again, not meant to be exhaustive, just kind of giving you guys an idea of what's out there, what's been. Worked on, and you know what's being talked about in our community these days. We're just reaching the tip of the iceberg, and with the Saturn jumping up in such popularity in the last three years, I mean, who knows what could come next? I mean, we could have maybe new developers releasing games to this thing at this point, like regularly, like the Dreamcast is. We have a list of five others that we wanted to take 30 seconds or so to just kind of talk about each. First up is Dragon Force 2. And this hit,、uh, the translation hit in, I think, 2015. One of the more popular and noted Saturn RPGs that has been translated in recent years. Yeah, it looks really fun. I, I never have a chance to play any of the Dragon Force games, but I'll definitely look it up. I mean, anything that's named after my favorite band, I mean, it can't be that bad, right? <laughs> I've played through Dragon Force 2. I was a big fan of the original Dragon Force. I think that's one of the Saturn's best games. 
Dragon Force 2 isn't as strong of an effort, but I mean, if you're a fan of the first game, then you're definitely going to enjoy the second one. I am a huge fan of the first game outside of the translation efforts. And, you know, when I did my, I took the translation patch and applied it myself. I didn't go out and get a pre-applied patch disc image. That's about the extent is where I've, I got to it outside of, you know, making the reproduction. It's on my list, but I know how much time I spent on Dragon Force 1. So I really want to set a, a good block of time to dedicate to that when it comes time to actually play Dragon Force 2. Didn't Chaz have a playthrough guide of Dragon Force 1 as well on our page? Yep, one of the first things that uh, Game Master Chaz did for us. Well, actually, he didn't do it for us. He he did it right before joining up with Shiro. We were very impressed with how he went through how to play that. Yeah, so if you're interested in playing the first one, want to know how to play the second one, hit that up. It's definitely useful. Next up on the list is Shining Force 3, scenarios 1, 2, and 3, as well as the premium disc. Now this one I thought was really interesting because it's like, we only got the first scenario in the US, but people loved it so much they wanted to put the other two out in the premium disc. So it's like, we we're finally getting that full Shining Force experience so we can finally play all of them versus just the first scenario. Yeah, Shining Force 3 has got to be my second favorite uh, Saturn game behind Knights. Shining Force 3 was actually the very last Sega-released game for the Saturn. Working Designs did put out uh, Magic Knight Ray Earth after Shining Force 3, but it was the last game that Sega put out uh, for the Saturn in the West. Love the game, and it's very story-driven, and so you finish the first scenario and you realize that the story's not over, and you want to know what happens next. For me personally, that was what finally got me into importing games. My very first uh, Japanese imports were uh, Scenarios 2 and 3, as well as the Premium Disc. And, uh, you know, the, the translation of this game has got quite a story behind it. Um, there was a team called the Espinia team that were uh, initially translating it. It was hosted over on uh, Shining Force Central website. I remember I ended up I ended up printing uh, on paper the entire uh, translation, you know, and we're talking early 2000s. And this thing, you know, I needed a uh, three-inch binder to hold every single page of the translation, and that's how I played through uh, scenarios two and three for the first time. Anyways, eventually, of course, it you know became a full English patch and played through that a few times. And folks, if you like the Shining series, this is an absolute masterpiece. The save files transfer from one scenario on to another so actions you take in you know the first scenario will affect events in future scenarios and the save files are interchangeable between the u.s scenario one as well as the uh, japanese uh, scenarios two and three and so whether they're patched or not those save files will work and transfer over and it's just such a masterpiece so for any of you who haven't played it go ahead and do it it's 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 a phenomenal experience do you still have said binder no, said binder is no longer uh, with me. It was starting to smell a little old, uh, <laughs> especially, uh, you know, with the actual English patch uh, available. So I've parted ways with it. But, you know, it was one of those experiences that sort of opened my eyes to a whole nother level of Saturn gaming that was out there. I did it. F I mean, I guess it's not deep as scenarios two and three would have been, but I printed a lot of paper for Fire Pro Wrestling. Hey, worth it. Worth. Uh, nice. Nice nice uh, smell meme thrown in there. I didn't comment on it because I don't want to encourage him. <laughs> don't encourage bad behavior. All right, so moving on, your personal favorite out of this list, I think, is Police Knot. Yes, so this this was interesting. Originally, they did the translation on, I think it was like Kojima's birthday uh, for the PlayStation 1, I think in 2007, I think. It's been a while, but then uh, quite recently in 16, they shadow dropped Police Knots on the Saturn. While the PS version is good, the Saturn one has all the bonus materials. It's the best version of the game you can get over the 3DO, the PCFX, the PlayStation 1, and whatever else they released it on that's really obscure. But it's a full translation. You can use the, the light gun for it. So, I mean, that's how I played it. And yeah, it's, it's really cool. I, I love it. I loved how they even kept the Japanese dialogue in there. Those of you that don't know, it's a Kojima game, Kojima-based game, got the Metal Gear Solid, Zone of the Enders, etc. It's a spiritual successor to Snatcher, which is his other point-and-click game, and it's probably one of the best games I've played on the Saturn, in my opinion, just because I love the story, I love the deep police cliches. 
It has some issues, some other things in the game that I won't get into too much, but it's a really great game, and I'm glad it got translated after all this time, and I can enjoy all the Kojima games. Uh, what were your guys' experiences with uh, Police Knots? So I actually very recently picked up both Snatcher and Police Knots, the Japanese versions. I've not played either, but I'm aware of obviously the uh, Police Knots translation, so I'm very excited to get into it. And I just want to quickly mention that Dave, on one of his uh, music casts, he had some of the soundtrack of Police Knots as uh, one of his selections, and it it was just really cool. And so it just it it really made me interested in playing this game because I could just, you could tell that it was going to be an atmospheric experience. So I'm just really looking forward to it. Just got to find some time and I'm going to definitely sink my teeth into Police Knots. Yep. Speaking of Dave, that's actually how I first met him is I wanted to make a repro of Police Knots for the U.S. based off the concept art from the, uh, and the magazines of Police Knots when it was being released. I tried to make it and I had to actually hunt down the art book that had the Police Knots image in it and scan that in and i created a repro of it and then dave was like yeah it looks good but i can i can help you make it better and he helped clear it up and printed it out and actually gave it to me for christmas about a year ago and it's cool that i actually can have that physically because i love love police knots and i think it's probably going to be one of dave's next games he's going to work on for repros it's it's just amazing and of course k also also made me a great repro of Police Knots as well, which I love. It's a special number one Shiro edition, and it's probably one of my most prized Siren games of all time. And I can't thank you and Dave enough for that, because you guys know how much I love Kojima. To the point where I actually just recently got a tattoo. Tattoo Merrill has in Police Knots, which is that, that fox. The, the blue uh, foxhound logo from Metal Gear 2. Oh, very nice, man. Kojima does amazing work. I only own a PS4 because of his work on uh, PT. I wouldn't have bought a PS4 if it hadn't been for that. Got Death Stranding coming up too. Well, there's hoping. And I personally would have liked to have seen the work that he, he was going to do on the whole Silent Hills franchise a little bit more than a new IP. I, I have to admit it. but No, I agree. Like Him and Guillermo del Toro on that horror game, I think it's probably one of the horror games I probably would pee myself playing. All right, so we got uh, two more on our list before we kind of head out. I want to talk about Asuka 120% Limit Over. This is a very odd title. Originally, the original game that's based on is um, Asuka 120% Burning Fest Limited. And this game has uh, had a number of releases. I believe it came out not only for the Saturn, but also for... The FM Towns, the X68000, the PC Engine, the PlayStation. So it was around like everywhere. What was interesting about Limit Over is that it got pushed out as a, a disc image that you had to burn and play. And no one really knows kind of where it came from. But the rumor has been that the original developers had a hand in making it. And it was a rebalance of Burning Fest Limited. That's wild. Yeah. So, you know, th- that, and it, it makes total sense. You know, they, I think they stripped out the story mode from it and focused mostly on just rebalancing the fighting characters for verses. Really cool that this even exists in the first place. But then someone decided that they were, you know, enough of a fan of the series that they wanted to do an English translation of the rebalanced edition that was floating around there. And so that's where we have Asuka Limit Over. That's ridiculous. I mean, what year did Rebalance come out? I want to say it came out in like early 2000s, might have been like late 90s. That's ridiculous. This is That's like crazy. I kind of want to play it now just out of principle. This is a game that I've not, that I wasn't even aware was translated. So that's super awesome. Yeah. So really kind of cool. That this you know exists at all, you can find information about you know limit over originally. You can see this again. You see a, a lot of our links are going to go to segextreme.net, but it was included on a torrent you know way back in the day, and it was a fan modification of the game. And according to this, it was done. You know, limit over was done uh, in 1998. Kind of crazy. That's insane. Is there any confirmation that the old devs worked on it, or is that just like rumors? It's all just rumors, but, you know, having access to 
be able to rebalance the characters and how they're fighting. Just a, a rundown of what was uh, apparently in the readme for the torrent. It was a simple and to the point menu, so there was no uh, story mode, only verses and ranking and deathmatch. We have new special moves that were made available. Additional dodge moves were made available. We have additional medium attacks, additional throws, balance tweaks, and taunts and auto combos. The level of detail that went into the hack screams more than just your average fan. This screams like having access to the original source code and being able to edit it. I'm definitely going to uh, run this at some event next time. This looks super interesting. That has been available for a number of years. I think the translation came out in 2015. Point being, it's obscure on a kind of a different level. All-girl fighting game and a translation of a hack of the original, not like a translation of the original, right? Meta. You know what? I've got no experience with this game at all, but it sounds super exciting. Like, I mean, I'm going to definitely see if I can get my hands on it and just give it a try. And that brings us to the last game on the already completed translation list. This being Revolutionary Girl uh, Utenia. The game came out in 98 originally, and... Sega actually supposedly was a, was a sponsor for the anime that was based on this. And I remember my sister being kind of a fan of it. Claire did mention it in a previous cast as well. This one had a translation project and it completed sometime in October of 2015. I got you. And this was the uh, this was the dating game, right? I think it was the dating game. Yeah, it's looking like a dating game. I'm down to play it. I love weird dating games maybe in a future stream perhaps wink wink well you know we got to get your stream going again mm, i might have to look into that see if i can get that going be a perfect game for just one person to play too but like what is going on but this translation has been in existence for quite some time and maybe because it doesn't carry the same kind of fan base that kojima carries or any of the really big name rpgs that we talked about tonight just kind of slipped under a lot of people's radars and so i'm really interested in all aspects of these patches and these translation projects these hacks again there's so much that we didn't even talk about you know there are hacks out there to alter the audio balancing in games like blast wind so like having changes like that ones that change music for other different aspects of fighting games things of that nature really intrigue me you know like the fan base the dedication that's involved in taking a part of game and fixing it or changing it and making it more accessible it really holds my interest that's really cool stuff and i'm really excited to see what the future holds for all these things maybe we can potentially sometime in the future have a way to play all the games in japan on the saturn as dumb as that may sound playing some obscure dating game actually would be kind of interesting to me at least even though it might be completely awful. Well, I mean, there were over well over a thousand uh, Saturn titles released in Japan, and the two Western libraries, like the the North American library and the European library, because they're not exactly the same, but they each clock in at about 250 games. So, you know, the the, the Japanese library is just vastly more games to, to pick from. So, yeah, I'd agree with you. Even the really weird games, like, I mean, the, do you guys remember I mentioned the uh, Midnight Love with the uh, River Alligator? That never got a translation. I'm looking forward to that. Like, there's just so many games that, you know, would be super cool to have in English. Makes you just want to learn Japanese so you can play all these games. Might be a little bit easier. Oh, you're doing that too. I can't can't believe I forgot. Yeah, it's it's funny. You know, we were talking earlier about the the Grandia translation. I mean, I've been playing through Grandia on the Saturn in Japanese, and I've been taking it real slow because I'm actually trying to read the text and understand what's going on and everything. And it's going pretty well for me. Where I do still get tripped up is in the um, like the excellent voice acting that they've got in the game. It just goes a little bit too fast in places for me. So, but overall, yeah, definitely, it's it's fun. But obviously, it'd be much easier to to just play these games in English. Yeah, definitely. But you know what? It's good that you're doing that because, you know, I mean, you have a motivation to learn that. Like, okay, I'm going to practice this by trying to play this. I mean, I did the same thing when I was learning German. I listened to music and watched videos and read things and just took it slow. So you're on a good track. Sooner or later, you'll be contributing to these Japanese translation projects.
Yeah, so I mean, that about covers off all of the translations that are either in progress or upcoming or even obviously the ones that are now fully complete. There are sure to be other ones that are in progress right now that that maybe aren't public knowledge yet. So, you know, uh, folks are working on games that haven't really been announced. Um, And there's definitely going to be future games uh, that are going to be translated just based on, you know, how the Saturn is now picking up steam in terms of popularity in the retro community. And all this stuff is super exciting. So if you have a means of playing games and patching them and, and having them go in English. And if you're listening to this podcast, you know, you're probably in that group of people that do have those means, then it's just, it's it's such an exciting time because we are getting some of the very best games that came out on the Saturn, but never in English, now being translated over for all of us to be able to enjoy. So yeah, it's just super exciting. With all of that said, we'd love to hear what games you guys would love to see translated. Maybe drop us some comments on our Facebook page. From all of us here at Sega Saturn Shiro, thank you so much for listening, and we will smell you later.